Hey MMA fans, this is Micah with Cage Minds doing our UFC 144 predictions. This event's going to be in Japan. UFC going to be in Pride Country. Should be a tremendous event. To any fighter that I mess up their name, not my intention. Very sorry about the mispronunciation if that happens. This is going to be a huge card. There's 12 matchups on this event. And it's headlined by the lightweight title being on the line. So we'll get right to the predictions. First one, Taekwon, the Mongolian Wolf Zhang, who's 15 and 2, taking on Issy Tamora, who's 6 and 2. Tamora is a late replacement, taking this fight on about 15 days' notice. Zhang has competed in the WEC and in Zufa. He has a deadly guillotine, very good stand-up. Good boxing background. Looking for in this fight with Tamora coming in on the shirt. Notice Tamora trains with Team Crazy B and he's a wrestler. His strengths are the wrestling. He's going to look to get this fight right to the ground. I haven't seen too much on him, but we'll see that he's going to take it to the ground. I look for Zhang and that crushing, crushing killer guillotine that he possesses to come into play. I think he'll pepper his opponent with shots using his punches to keep some distance in the first round. I think early second round, Tamora will get desperate to take this fight to the ground, be caught up in that vicious guillotine, and submitted. We're going to go second round guillotine victory for Taekwon Zhang. Next matchup we're talking about. Takeya Mizuzaki, who's 15, 6, and 2, is going to do battle with Chris the Kamikaze Kari Aso, who's 12 and 3. Mizuzaki has been in the WEC and UFC under Zufa for a while. He's 4 and 4 in that term. Only losses, though, to the upper echelon of the division, losing to Miguel Torres in a former title opportunity to Scott Jorgensen, Brian Bowles, and Uriah Faber. As far as Chris Carriasso goes, he has had very good battles with Will Capizano that turned out victorious for him, and also his last bout versus Von Lee. A great split decision battle that he had versus Michael Mayday McDonald turned out to be a loss. So both of these men have fought upper echelon competition and are very well-rounded. Mitsuzaki, again, primarily relies on his striking, uses his wrestling and grappling in defensive to try to keep the fight standing. He has a tendency against some of these upper echelon opponents to have his back taken, but he's good at defending off of the submissions. He's not the over-intense and assertive grappler that uses it for his own dominance. Chris Carriasso. His boxing very good too. He's the Golden Gloves champion. Has trained with some of the best Muay Thai practitioners in the world. Has a very solid kicking game. That was on demonstration in most of his fights. Against Michael McDonald, he was trying to use inside low kicks. And Mitsuzaki could try to use the page on McDonald's book and try to catch Karyasa with the overhand right. That's where the most danger is. Him using the leg kicks and then getting countered in for them. After that, Carriasso, though, has progressed. His grappling has progressed to where he was able to take Von Lee, who was prompted out to be a submission expert. Carriasso was able to take him to the ground, use ground and pound, and use control. Um, this is a big, a big call on my part. Carriasso is pretty heavily an underdog, but I think he wins this fight. I think he steals a split decision with a more assertive grappling. I think he's going to be the one pushing forward grab his opponent and be able to land the trips, the throws, get it to the ground, and be effective with the ground and pound. I think Chris Carey also steals a split decision in Japan. He's used to this. He did this in 138 in England against Von Lee. He'll be the bad guy, and he'll come out with a decision victory. Again, we're going with Chris Carey also. Next matchup we're talking about, Ricky Fukuda, who's 17-5. and five. is going to take on Steve Robot Cantwell, who's 7-5. and five. Fukuda, last time we saw him in Octagon was about a year ago when he was... The victim of a judge's very bad decision against Nick Wang. Fakuda should have won that decision. His wrestling, his ground and pound, his pressure. It was so much greater than the abilities that Ring put forth. But, talking about the present now, he's here to come back against Cantwell. He's been away from the cage due to injury, due to the tragic tsunami in Japan. He's refocused. He's ready to put on a show for his hometown people. He really seems focused on this. Cantwell is on a four-fight Losing streak, three a lightweight, 
light heavyweight, one now at middleweight. This is going to be his second time at middleweight. Hopefully, he shows better cardio. If not, I think that Fukuda will be able to easily out-wrestle, out-grapple, put the pressure on Cantwell. If Cantwell has adjusted to it, he's going to be looking to use his technical striking game to stay away, use kicks and punches to try to extenuate his two-inch height and reach advantage. But from what we've seen of Cantwell as of late, I don't think he's going to be able to do it. I think he's going to get pressured, put against the cage. Fakuda is going to be landing uppercuts using the dirty boxing, drop down levels, grab the double leg, get on top, use ground and pound. I'm going so far as to say this is going to be 30-27. Ricky Fakuda wins a unanimous decision with his grappling. Next matchup, Nifume Kid Yamamoto, 18-5, and taking on Von Lee, 11-7-1. and Kid Yamamoto... One and four in his last five meetings. So if you take away his last five contests, you see why he's an icon in Japan. That would put him at 17 and one with his record. Going back to Japan, there's a lot of pressure. He's a big prestigious part of this card for the UFC. But also, this could be the last time we see him as both of these men are fighting for their jobs. Two consecutive losses for Kid Yamamoto, who came in with a lot of hype. Von Lee, not as much hype, but Chris Carey also did beat him last time and controlled the submission fighter on his back on the ground. Kid Yamamoto is known as a kickboxer and a wrestler. From the weaknesses that we've seen in Von Lee's ground game, it does lead me to the idea that Yamamoto would be able to aggressively attain takedowns, get on top, and that Von Lee is not going to do much. Carey also, Chris Carey also said that Von Lee felt weak when he was underneath, that he was able to really dominate him on the ground. I think Yamamoto would be able to. Kid Yamamoto has that vicious knockout power, too. His one victory in those last five fights was a vicious knockout of Steve Lopez. So Yamamoto could easily do that. Von Lee, known for finishing his fights, 11 victories, 6 submissions, 4 TKOs, very unimpressive, and even seemed a little slow and sluggish, it could have been the moment, it could have been the adrenaline dump. For my best guess right now, from what we've seen of the two men, I think that Yamamoto, at home in Japan, this is either he rises to the occasion or he loses. If he rises to the occasion, I'm going to be right. I think he wins this one with the third round TKO, finishing it off in the later rounds, he has to rise to the moment or lose his job. For Von Lee... I don't know if he's going to be able to able handle the speed and the movement of Yamamoto. If Yamamoto is on, he should be faster. He should be in and out and catching and more powerful with the strikes. Von Lee could improve. It could have been the stage fight, and we could see a whole different new fighter. And my Hulker prediction on this fight could be wrong. But for right now, I'm feeling pretty confident. My kid Yamamoto, third round TKO at UFC 144. Next matchup we're talking about. Takanori Gomi, the fireball kid, 32-8, and eight, takes on Iji... Mitsuoka, who's 18-7-2. and Takanori Gomi, we know he has vicious knockout power, a good sprawling brawl, not been so successful in the UFC, where most of the lightweights are a lot bigger than him. To keep competing in the UFC, it would be an, an advantage for Gomi to move down to featherweight. Don't know if he wants to do that. What we do know is that he has the knockout power. He's put it on Tyson Griffin. He's had effective matches with Kenny Florian, even though Florian did use to extend the, the jab, take it to the ground. In this matchup versus Mitsuoko, who Mitsuoko has 11 career submission victories, he's going to look to take this to the ground and get the submission. But unlike most of the other UFC bats that Gomi's been in, he's not the smaller man. He will have a size advantage. The strength is where we're really going to see, but I think the sprawl and brawl technique works out, and I think I see a second round TKO, a big right hook from Takanori Gomi. Mitsuoka could surprise us, but I've seen very little video of him, so I'm going with the second round TKO and Takanori Gomi. Next matchup is Anthony Showtime Pettis, 12 and 2, taking on Joe J. Lo Lozon, who's 20 and 6. Pettis, he recognized his defaults and always tries to work on them in mixed martial arts. His wrestling game, he's been diligently working on that with Ben Eskren, the Bellator welterweight champion. We know about his kickboxing and his taekwondo, that he's a black belt, that he's very proficient with his kicks, and that he's very creative in the striking game. Not a bad submission, great with the arm bar, fast with the hips and his legs. His opponent, Joe Lozon, Really tight submission game himself, can do anything with it. Proficient with his hands. I'd say if there's any kind of really split, precise 
advantage I see coming. I think that Pettis has more diligently worked an ability to use his wrestling game and a slight advantage in the striking. Lozon does get an experience advantage, but Anthony Pettis has beat guys with more experience. He keeps putting it together. I think we see a pretty even striking battle. Pettis may even look to take this to the ground to win rounds, but I don't think he needs to be playing around with such a good submission practitioner as Lozon. I think Lozon gets this to the ground, gets to an advantageous position if he's able to land a big punch, a la how he did Malvin Gallard, and then jump into a great position. Pettis, I think, is more, persist more precise with his striking. He'll keep a cooler, calmer head, more relaxed, more in the moment, and more aware than Melvin Gillard was. I think his technical abilities are going to outshine Lozon, and then he'll win this fight with a unanimous decision, not allowing Lozon to take to the ground. And if he does, Pettis will be on top. Pettis is the faster striker, and he'll land the more number of strikes to take this decision victory. We're going with Anthony Pettis. Next matchup we got Hatsu Hayoki, 25-4-2, taking on Bart Barnabas Palaszewski, who's 43-13. Hatsu Hayoki, widely regarded as one of the top three featherweights in the world. We know that his most dangerous weapon is his submission game. He finishes most of his fights. 25 victories, and he has 10 submissions, 6 TKOs. That's 16 finishes with only 9 decisions. Hayoki is pretty well-rounded everywhere. He's going to use his striking, he's going to use his long lengthy frame, try to keep out of the distance, pop back in, extenuate the slight reach advantage and the height advantage that he does have. He can take a beating, we've seen him stand up with Marlon Sandro, who is a tremendous Muay Thai practitioner. So the stand up, very well for Heoki. What he doesn't have working for him is the power. Bart Palaszewski has that one shot knockout ability to end this fight at a moment's notice. For if Palaszewski wins this fight, it's going to be with his veteranship, it's going to be with his strength, and it's going to be with the power in his punches. I think that Heoki is going to be able to get inside the back, push against the cage, get a trip, take this to the ground, wear on. But I don't think he's going to have the paralysis or the ability to really steal the submissions. It's a little different when you have the rules from Shuto where they're not allowed to use elbows, where the unified rules of mixed martial arts, they are allowed to use elbows. Heoki didn't was not too aggressive on the ground, more controlling and looking for submissions. That could come back to bite him at some point. Palaszewski finishes most of his fights, wins them with TKOs or submission. He's no slouch. He'll be wise to everything Hiroki's going to do. This is going to be a very hard-fought battle. I could see this going to the split decision, but I think 29-28, Hiroki with ground control will win this fight. But I would not be surprised to see Palaszewski ruin everyone's day with a large right hand and a knockout, a possible bat, fast flurry. He has great hands, as we saw demonstrated in his last bout versus Tyson Griffin. Next matchup we got is between Yoshihiro Thunder Okami, who's 26 and 6, taking on Tim the Barbarian Boach, who's 14 and 4. This will carry some weight within the middle division, middleweight division, the winner of this fight. Okami, we haven't seen him since he was losing to Anderson Silva. Prior to that, he had beat Nate Morcart and Mark Munoz. Mark Munoz, a black belt in wrestling. This is important because Tim Boach is another very powerful, very strong wrestler who's developing into a well-rounded mixed martial artist. In an experience advantage, it has to go to Yushin Okami. He's fought more guys. He's fought guys like Jake Shields, Anderson Silva twice. He has that experience advantage. Tim Boach has not fared well against the upper echelons of divisions. That's what happened when he got up in the light heavyweights, got to Phil Davis, and was kind of controlled and dominated in that one. Not big enough. Big, strong, burly guy, but still just not big enough to handle some of those much larger guys. In this fight, he's fighting one of the largest middleweights there is in Yushin Okami. Okami's going to have the height advantage and the reach advantage. The first time that really Boach is having to deal with a bigger, thicker man in this weight class as Kendall Grove he treated like a toothpick and manhandled. And Kendall Grove is a serious fighter, too. What we look to happen in this one is it's really up to Okami. If Okami can put on the same performances that he was able to do against Marquardt and against Munoz, push off, use a sprawl and brawl. His last time he was dominated on the ground was by Chow Sutton. That was the last time they fought, or it could have been last week in training. Chow Sutton and Yushin Okami, there's not much better wrestling training that Okami could get. 
Boats is going to have to bring something pretty special to this. As far as the striking goes, Okami has proved to be more than a formidable striker. Again, outstriking Marquardt and Munoz. I think he has the more precise hands and the bigger knockout power. But Tim Boach does have a raw power and finesse about him. If Okami does get put on the ground on his back, there is a high chance for a submission out of Tim Boach. He does have that advantage. If Tim Boach wins this fight, it's from a submission or or it's from being able to use his wrestling to control. But I think that Okami is going to be able to use faster, quicker punches, keep the distance, throw in some leg kicks, weaken his opponents, and use his sprawl to just push off and push away. I think Okami wins this fight 29-28 in a unanimous decision version. Next matchup we're talking about. Yoshihiro Akiyama, 13-4, taking on Jake Shields, 26-6. This fight has drove me crazy. It's been hard for me to break down in the sense that Akiyama's coming in off of three straight, almost four straight losses, where Shields is coming in off of three straight. Akiyama did win over Alan Belcher. I thought that was highly disputed. I thought that was controversial, and Belcher did a lot of damage. Losing and gassing out to the triangle that wasn't even properly put on by Chris Lieben was another bad on Yakiyama. He wasn't able to keep his cardio up and keep the pace of Michael Bisbing and wasn't able to handle the power of Vitor Belfort. Well, for the good thing about Akiyama, we've heard a lot about his ground game. None of these guys have wanted to take him to the ground, except for when he was able to take Lieben to the ground and Lieben was able to just outlast him, outwant it. He wanted it more and he took it. He hasn't had a deal with a wrestler. Well, that takes us to his opponent, Jake Shields. Jake Shields has a very minute amount of stand-up ability. We've never really seen it. We've never really seen it used beautifully. We saw one good punch against Georgia St. Pierre that caused an abrasion under the eye of St. Pierre, and he was able to win a round over GSP. Outside of that, though... He looked abysmal and atrocious with his stand-up against Martin Catman in a fight that I really thought Catman won. When Shields, it's not the beauty of his wrestling, it's his wrestling and pushing forward and his relentlessness to get the takedowns that find him in advantage, advantageous positions. It's can he rebound from these losses, though. Jake Ellenberger crushed him. The excuse for that, very viable. His father had just passed away. So that one, that one you can almost throw off the books. That wasn't Jake Shields out there. He didn't have his mental capacity together. Jake Shields is slightly favored in this fight. We, we have to look at also, Yakiyama is moving down to 170. Well, when Shields had that fight from 185 to 170, this is a man that had fought back and forth in both divisions. He even looked horrible and gassed out against Martin Catman. So for uh, Yoshihiro Akiyama, that's already had cardio problems, how can we really say that dropping a weight class is going to help? And we're pretty sure that this fight is going to be exhausting and grueling and fought at a pace of grappling. Akiyama has a distinct advantage in the striking game and a distinct power advantage. It's to him to be able to use his judo and his core strength to keep it standing. Like we said, we haven't seen much impressive grappling as of late out of Jake Shields. With his lack of a stand-up game, Akiyama has the much better stand-up game. Akiyama on his 13 victories, one of those is a decision, 6 TKOs, 6 submissions. Pretty proficient with his own ground game. As long as he's able, I think, to not let it go to the ground and use that judo core strength to push away, perhaps maybe get some throws, put Shields on the bottom, but do not play around on the ground. I think in a split decision, if he's able to last it, Akiyama could outlast, get better positions, and have more strikes landed to take the victory over Jake Shields. In that same way, there is the possibility for Shields to get on top of a gassed Akiyama and finish it with a submission in the third round if Yakiyama just does not react well to this weight cut. A lot of questions to be answered in that fight right now. I feel that Akiyama by the split decision is the pick. Next matchup we're talking about, Mark Super Samoan Hunt, who's 7-7, seven and seven, taking on Chet Congo, who's 27-6-2. Mark Hunt, in his first UFC bout, was taken down and submitted quite easily by Sean McCorkle. Took some time off, improved his grappling, came back, pushed away Chris Tookshire, and ended up knocking him out, walk off to EKO, in spectacular fashion. His next matchup was versus Ben Rockwell up in Denver. Both men gassed. 
and Hunt was able to out-survive landing on top and showed better wrestling than the wrestler, wrestler Rockwell. Chet Congo, not really any formal wrestling experience of his own, but was able to use takedowns and top control along with punches, kicks, and a lot of movement to beat Matt Mitrione in his last fight. I think Chet Congo's found the way he wants to fight. Every, since that Pat Berry fight, the Pat Berry fight where he got looked like knocked in and out of conscious two or three times, it looked to put a fear into Chet Congo that he was not willing to stand in the pocket and exchange with Matt Mitrione. We know it's not a good idea to exchange with Mark Hunt. Mark Hunt, Mark Hunt can win this fight with one strike at any time. He wins it with the KO. The impressive part would be if Hunt is able to not gas this time. We're in Japan. There's they're not at such high altitude. He should be able to keep a better cardio ability. But still, Congo has the better cardio, the better physique, the better muscle structure. So we're looking for him to be the more powerful fighter. I think he's going to use his movement and his smarts and outthink Hunt to kind of play the same game that he did with Mitrione and be able to get a victory. I don't see Congo coming in there and standing and trading. I think we see him use his moment, try to get kicks, extenuate his reach advantage, extenuate that 8 inch height advantage, stay away, play it safe, and I think Chet Congo takes another unanimous decision as he'll take a step forward, but I'm not excited about Chet Congo from the way he fought about Matt Mitrione. Be more excited, and probably on the night we'll be cheering for Mark Hunt to knock him out, but I think I see a unanimous decision for Congo with just a more plethora of skills, and he's had more time working on those skills. Going to go with Chet Congo in the unanimous decision. Now we're up to the co-main event. This matchup is between Quinn and Rampage Jackson, who's 32-9, and nine, taking on Ryan Darth Vader, who's 13-2. and two. Rampage is returning to Pride Country, his country, where he started. When we see the big slams out of Rampage. Don't know about all that, but what we do know to expect is the sprawl and brawl and a lot of punches to be thrown. Between neither of these athletes do I expect to see a single kick. Rampage has the, the vicious knockout power, the best pure outboxer possibly in all of mixed martial arts. Ryan Bader is a very avid student of the sweet science trying to learn his boxing increase his footwork rampage jackson has fought high caliber wrestlers before was able to stuff matt hamill's takedowns even though i believe that the that the bader takedowns will be harder will be faster he'll be rushing in more that he's more explosive than matt hamill i see rampage still being able to use his exquisite sprawl and his power to throw off bader i see bader in the second round coming in with a right hook rampage possibly avoiding it, pushing it off a little, and connecting with a plethora of his own shots. I think that he'll land that left hook, he'll land the right uppercut, and he'll put Ryan Darth Bader to sleep. I think that Rampage is going to be motivated for this fight. It's back in pride country. We're going to see a tremendously motivated Rampage, and I think he wins with the second round TKO for Rampage. That takes us up to our main event of the night now. Frankie the Answer Edgar, 14 1 and 1, is defending his 155 pound lightweight title versus number one contender Ben Smooth Henderson, who's 15 and 2. This is a fight I've been waiting for for quite a long time, actually, ever since the merger of the WEC UFC. My initial prediction back then was that Henderson would beat Pettis, that Edgar would beat Maynard, and then that. Ben Henderson would become UFC champion. Well, it's taken a while. It's taken a diverted course, but I think it's both helped both men grow. Ben Henderson has had battles with Jim Miller, with Clay Guida, Mark Bocek. He's became more dominant. His grappling, his striking, he's taken his whole entire game to a new level. Frankie Edgar, he looks bad in first rounds, but can fight through the heart of the champion. His desire, his will is unbreakable. He's taken bad shots. He's been able to survive these two wars with Frankie, Frankie Edgar survived two wars with Gray Maynard and with BJ Penn. Now he moves on to a new opponent, and I wonder if he's had too many fights with too many guys of the same tendency. BJ was just going to stand and throw punches, Maynard was going to stand and throw punches, and then possibly look for the takedowns. It's a whole new animal this time for Frankie Yeager. Ben Henderson has cardio that's not going to quit. Both of these men will be even on the cardio. Frankie Yeager is used to a giant cardio advantage against most of his opponents. I don't believe he possesses that 
versus Henderson. As always, Frankie is at a disadvantage when it comes to the height and the reach, and most likely on fight night with the weight. I do believe that not in his last four bouts was this the case, but Frankie Edgar does have the knockout capability and power advantage with the strikes over Ben Henderson. Put away Gray Maynard, we haven't really seen Henderson put away guys with the strikes. But again, the differences that Henderson poses. Be out of his last fights, Frankie Edgar was not looking for guys to throw kicks. Henderson's going to throw a lot of kicks. Henderson has the strongest legs probably in all of mixed martial arts, is going to drive the positions, and I think end up in better positions on the takedown. I think that he's the better grappler. He has the longer limbs. He's going to be able to lock in more, do more control. This is going to be a long, grueling fight. And I think that we end up seeing by the end of it a unanimous decision, three rounds to two, Ben Smooth Henderson will become the new UFC lightweight champion of the world. I'm going to take Ben Henderson with that unanimous decision. Those have been our predictions for 141. We'll go back through them real quick. First matchup we had, we're taking Taekwon Zhang, the Mongolian Wolf, with a second round guillotine. In the second matchup, we have Chris Carriasso winning with a split decision. Third matchup, Ricky Fukuda with a unanimous decision. I got Kid Yamamoto in the fourth matchup with a TKO in the third round. Takanori Gomi in that fifth matchup with a TKO in the second, possibly even a knockout because we've seen his power. Sixth matchup, Anthony Pettis to win a unanimous decision over Joe Lozon. Hatsu Hayoki in the seventh matchup to take a 29-28 unanimous decision over Bart Palaszewski. Palaszewski, though, like I said, beware of his power. Next matchup I was taking, Yushin Thunder Okami. We're taking him with the unanimous decision. Yoshihiro Akiyama we're taking with a split decision. Chet Congo with the unanimous decision. Ryan, uh, Ryan Bader getting knocked out by Rampage Jackson in the second round. Go Rampage. And Ben Henderson to win a unanimous decision, and we will have a new 155-pound lightweight champion. He will be named Ben Smooth Henderson. This has been Cage Minds. Leave us a comment, like the video, subscribe to the channels, hit us up on Facebook, Twitter. It's Cage Minds. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. Uncage the warrior within yourself.